Welcome to our stonker of an exhibition, Strip, how football got shirty. It looks at the history of the football shirt from a design, fashion and technology level. So let's have a look around, eh? So this is the beginning of the exhibition. This is the first century of Strip. So we take you through five or six changes in football kits in a huge amount of time, but very little in terms of the change of kit design and kit technology. There wasn't really a great deal of change in that first century. So we've got a shirt here that's from 1874. It's a replica. This is a typical football shirt from around the 1900s, uh, turn of the century. Uh, we don't actually know who this shirt was worn by. Obviously there were quite a few prominent teams at the time that wore red and white stripes. Um, if you've got any ideas, let us know. So this is one of the best shirts in the collection, in my opinion anyway. It is the um, Bolton Wanderers shirt from 1953 FA Cup final against Blackpool. Everyone remembers the score, but what not a lot of people know is that um, it's one of the first times that a man-made fibre was worn in a football shirt. It's made of artificial silk and the idea was that it would reflect um, floodlights when floodlights were coming into English football. Obviously the FA Cup final was played in the daytime, but they stuck with this shirt um, to give a good impression. Unfortunately it didn't really work out well from that day. So here we have a classic Manchester City shirt um, from the 1969 FA Cup final. Apparently uh, City's assistant manager at the time, Malcolm Allison, was inspired to outfit uh, the side in this um, strip because um, he was inspired after watching AC Milan knock out City's rivals United from the European Cup earlier on in that season. Um, they've revisited this design quite a few times since, but this is arguably the definitive version. We leave the first century behind and then we enter into the game changer Admiral come along, a company based in Leicester. They'd been involved in producing football equipment for a number of years, but they were the first ones that really saw the monetary value of, the, of, of kit. Umbro in 1966, they um, paid all the, all the federations to supply their shirts, because traditionally clubs or nationalities would pay the kit suppliers. For the, shirt, for the kit. <clears throat> Umbro changed that in 66, but Admiral not, took it up a notch. Several notches, probably. Um, the first sort of commercial deal, really, in football shirts was done between Admiral and Leeds United. Bert Patrick, the CEO of Admiral, he was a very savvy businessman. And back then, you didn't really have the sort of the commercial departments at football clubs. A lot of these deals were done directly with the football managers. Um, Bert Patrick went to Don Revy, Leeds manager, and said, how would you feel about having an Admiral kit and we'll pay you? And Don Revy said, well, you're not touching our sacred white shirt. Forget about that. But maybe you can have a play around with our away shirt. So this little beautiful Leeds shirt here, that was their away shirt. And that was the first shirt that Admiral did that was like in a commercial sense. and. Quite bold at the time. A, you've got a logo on it, wow. B, you've got taping on the arms. That was quite an interesting development. And look at that faded Leeds crest. A lot of the clubs had deviations in their crests in the sort of 70s. Don Revy leaves Leeds, goes to manages England. Bert Patrick, he's instantly saying, Don, what about England now? That was an England shirt that was used for four years, six years, I think. And it's quite nice. This is a very rare shirt. This is a Manchester United third shirt, used between the years 1975 and 1980. It wasn't like it is today. Teams would wear shirts for a number of years. Um, and we think it was only used in a couple of games. This one, very rare. Look at this lovely, Hornet here, Watford. They're having a laugh back then. And look at the look at this lovely Cardiff shirt. But look at the way that Umbro logo is fiddling around with that blue bluebird. It's getting a bit close there, isn't it? Um, we've got a brilliant film showing the ages of Admiral here. We had the fortune to interview Bert Patrick, and he had a wealth of knowledge. And hopefully some of that will be appearing online very soon. Look at that classy Crystal Palace shirt there. 
That's from Umbro though. Umbro were also in the mix at this period, doing some great shirts and it was really a, still a sort of, in terms of our domestic game, it was still the UK companies that were sort of dominating it. You still had your butters, I think, in that period. It was Umbro, Aberall, they were the three leaders really on the UK football scene. Let's go and have a look at sponsorship now. Sponsorship came into football in the mid uh, 1970s. Um, there were a few different countries tried it out before England. Um, famous example is this Eintracht Braunschweig shirt. I hope I've said that right. Uh, famously sponsored by Jägermeister. Apparently, the company also tried to get the team to rebrand and actually call themselves something like Jägermeister FC. Um, it didn't happen, and uh, sponsorship in Germany was was not a big thing for a while. One of the first sponsors in England was uh, Hitachi. They were on the shirt of Liverpool back in the uh, 1980s. Um, but actually their rivals Everton beat them to it by about a week as they got their Hafnia branded shirts um, in action uh, in a match a bit earlier than that. If we come into the present day, um, some teams are actually wearing more than one sponsor. This shirt has 14 different sponsors on it. Um, English football's recently introduced sleeve sponsors, but I really hope, as a bit of a purist, that it's never going to get this, uh, this far in England. Bangers, eye popping ones. So, this is where music and football collide, really. This is an absolute banger. This is England's third shirt from 1990, famously worn by New Order's Bernard Sumner in the World in Motion video. Um, this was where football was cool because. In the 80s, a lot of the sort of casuals, they'd wear high-end designer gear, but they wouldn't be caught dead in the football shirt. Bernard Sumner made it cool. That's a cool shirt. This one was worn by Andre Kanchelskis in one of the, the one of their final Soviet Union games before they came back to be in Russia. Um, it's quite nice. Liverpool, when they they wore the shirt when they last won the league. And obviously. It's probably their most bold designed home shirt. And that's what you find in this exhibition. There's this concept, misconception really that the 90s were all about bold shirts, but actually it was really only on their away shirts where teams went bold or third shirts. But that one is quite a bold design shirt. This is brilliant. This is bright and they're going all psychedelic on this one. Nobo, in case you're wondering, is short for notice board. So that's what the sponsor was there. But it's brilliant because one of the great things out the exhibition, you've got your yeah, Adidas, Umbros, Nike, you've got all these big brands, Hummel. But you also have these little companies that appear. This is Sports Express. I wonder if they're still going, I don't know. This is the wall of Adidas. You've got your iconic uh, West Germany shirt with the geometric pattern that was made famous by the Netherlands. But they also made a lot of these uh, de template designs got used for other clubs. This is a little Chilean club going for a cheeky Netherlands number there. I'm sure they weren't as good as Cruyff or Van Basten, etc. But prototype, Ireland went with this, the pattern made thing for West Germany, never wore it. Palestino, another South American club going for the German vibes. And even Cork City. This is a crazy shirt, this French one. But it's pretty cool. Um, it's probably got the best interpretation for an item we've ever done. Let me find the label. A precursor to the Adidas equipment range style, this shirt creates a terrifying Frankenstein effect with red details resembling oversized stitching between the blue and white elements. Obviously. This is a, a I mean, this is the great thing we, with Democrat democratised football and removed a lot of the tribalism from, from the game and you've got your France, you've got your Germany but you've also got this little Newport, the Isle of Wight, it's not even Newport County and they had this shirt in 1990, their third shirt and it was provided to them by Sanders Sports, another little sort of local company and it's crazy. Look at that pattern, it looks like an artwork. There's lots of bangers, they're all here, so many bangers. 
This was won by Kevin Francis, the six foot seven Stockport County striker. And it's almost mirroring, it's like a knockoff version basically of the Arsenal's bruised banana. You've got a lot of tartan going on randomly. This is a Norwich City tartan shirt. We don't know why Norwich went tartan. They had a goalkeeper with Scottish brain gun. I assume that's why. Here we've got a Scotland women's shirt from 1993. Match winner entered this shirt into the most Scottish football shirt ever competition. And I presume they won. It's really Scottish. Um, this, is a, this brings back a lot of memories to me. This is a lovely tangerine Blackpool shirt um, from 1989 to 1990. I started watching Blackpool this season when I was eight years old. When the players were running around the pitch, they looked like shimmering kingfishers. Um, and it didn't really look tangerine either. It, it looked a little bit orange and a little bit salmon, pink. But it definitely didn't look tangerine. And it's got some crazy thing going on here. It's got an all over diamond pattern. The use of the hash diamonds in the design on a white background gives the impression of various shades. But there's actually just one color. It's tangerine. Um, <clears throat> Australia, this was mad. They sort of picked this up again recently for the Women's World Cup. Ajax, I love this one. This one's brilliant because at the start of the shirt, they've gone very kind of conservative pinstripes, but towards the end, they've sort of collided into a plethora of cascading geometric shapes. I think they started that one when the, in the day and that one after they've been to an all-night rave, I'm guessing. Um, Northern Ireland here, another banger really in a very left field and almost op-art influenced. Hull Tiger print, they've kind of revisited that this season but that was bolder. So in recent years, uh, the women's national teams have been given uh, bespoke kits uh, outfitted for themselves personally. Um, but before that, it was uh, mainly wearing the men's shirts, perhaps in an outsized uh, model of it, or even a replica version. But if we go back to before the English uh, women's national team uh, were taken on board by the FA, they actually had their own bespoke kits, their own bespoke crests, and here's a really interesting design by Ribeiro, famous for the um, kits made for... Um, Norwich and uh, others and they, they did this great England women's shirt in 1991. This is a disgusting shirt, I don't know what was going on in Huddersfield really with this one. Utter bio. But it's still interesting. Like we've put on the label, like the sun, try not to look at it for too long. Make your mind up on for which sun we're talking about there. Um, this is an interesting shirt and this is a Manchester United Supporters Club ladies shirt. Now, this was made famous by the men's team, obviously, but look at the state of it. The women were being forced to wear this shirt like this, week in, week out. The men didn't have to, have to do that. So it's almost like that. They were given hand-me-downs and that was well worn. So this is our section in the exhibition about technology and kits. There was a time just after all the bold designs came out that things got stripped back down to basics and it was more about the technology in making the shirts and in the manufacturing of the textiles. So we've got some great examples here. This kind of Lycra um, Italy shirt with the strange uh, elongated sleeves and the very tight fit. Apparently it wasn't a big hit at the time of the Italy players, but it was an interesting development nevertheless. Uh, next to it, we've got Umbro's experiment with bringing back wool into football kits. It can only really be described as scratchy, so it's an experiment that was very short-lived. So that's the famous Arsenal Bruce Banana shirt there. I showed you the knockoff version before that worn by Stockport County. Um, Drake Cranborg, he was a great designer, still works for Nike today, and um, he came up with this lightning bolt design for Arsenal. He also designed this very aggressive shoulder design shirt for Borussia Dortmund. This is a Chelsea shirt, it's grey. Grey doesn't work on football shirts. It's a fatal mistake, don't ever go grey. It has got orange in, everybody likes a bit of orange on a football shirt, but it still didn't quite work, but it's bold. And this one 
is where David Seaman was partying hard in Euro 96. So, so much going on. For some reason, it repeats Football Association over and over again. Nobody knows why that is. It's got England, England, Football Association. It's kind of like they've thrown everything into the, in the kitchen sink with that one, but it's still a banger. So welcome to our Hall of Shame section, the most infamous football kits of all time. And here's the uh, prime example. Uh, back in the early 80s, uh, when sp uh, sponsorship came into football, um, Coventry City went a little bit too far. Uh, this big T sign in the middle is actually the logo of Talbot, which was a French car company with ties to that area. Um, but it replaced all the identity of the kit. Uh, the club had actually been wearing a club crest on their shirts, even back in the 60s when most teams weren't. And as soon as this advertisement came in, it always relegated. Uh, it doesn't even appear anywhere on the kits. In fact, you've just got three big T logos as well as a big T in the label. We're still in the Hall of Shame, and this is a lovely Iceland shirt. It's an Iceland away shirt from 2002-04 for the women's team. And it's a good shirt, or at least average at best. But it's in the Hall of Shame because those naughty Icelandic FA, they actually said to the women, we've got these sh shirts hanging around, you can wear that. It's a men's double extra large. I'm guessing she wasn't suited for that shirt. Cardiff came up with the ultimate betrayal really in um, 2012. The, the club chairman uh, rebranded Cardiff City, they got rid of the traditional blue, he got rid of the blue bird or rather made it tiny here and brought in um, a Chinese style dragon. Fans really were quite upset and they set up um, a pressure group to try and convince the club to change back to blue. It took them two or three years but eventually they came back and this is deserving of a place in the Hall of Shame. There's been a progression from female planes wearing shirts designed for men to tailored shirts, and now you're at the point where they are getting their own bespoke designs. So Nike really stepped things up at, the, at last summer's Women's World Cup, and this is sheer, elegant perfection. So it's a realisation that football shirts are becoming a bit of a disposable item, and that's not really something that we like to see. Um, kits used to last five years, before that they lasted 10, maybe 20 years. Uh, now we're on a one year kit cycle. Each team might produce three separate kits every year and that can't be a good thing for the planet. Luckily there are manufacturers like Player Layer who are developing new technologies to help make uh, the environmental cost of a football kit much lower than it was previously. Uh, this is what they've produced for Forest Green Rovers this year. And it's made of 50% bamboo charcoal. Um, in partnership with Player Layer, we've actually produced our own football kit designed by uh, Manchester's own Stanley Chow. A lot of the exhibition looks at how the sort of football shirts have drawn on the fashion industry for inspiration, but this section is it's sort of spun on its head. So this is how the fashion world has been inspired by football shirts. Um, you've had a lot of kind of fashion labels doing collaborations with some of the sports manufacturers. So we've got here, for example, the Adidas Palace Times Juve collaboration that was worn in one game. Um, Palace of a Skateboard Company. Um, we've got things like um, Crep City's collaboration with Umbro. They're also like a streetwear company and they kind of looked at some of those classic 90s Umbro designs. It's the same for Pata, a company in Amsterdam, streetwear label. They sort of drew heavily on Umbro's 90s pedigree and created these collaborations. We did some, uh, we did, we've got quite a number of shirts on display here from Foco Haler, which is the work of Los Deos. Um, he uh, does some sort of custom one-off shirts, just like these, but he also does his own shirts. This is an interesting one, it's called Ingaland. It's got bulldogs on it rather than the lions. And it's, a t it's basically a photograph of your rich teas, your nice biscuits, your custard creams, traditional English biscuits on there. He did this one, which is kind of Croatia, but in roses. And then some of the one-off shirts, where it really gets 
Interesting. This one is a John Burko tribute shirt. It's got Brexit with an arrow going down and it's got Monty Python's Flying Circus. And it's kind of his take on our political system. He's an American, he lives in Germany, he's looking from the outside. This is the end product of his work. And then we've got a shirt with much more profound meaning. This is a St. Pauli shirt that's made from recycled life jackets. And it's got hope on it. And it says, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. So he does playful stuff, he does serious stuff. Everyone's got their own idea about what the greatest football shirt of our time is. At the museum, we couldn't really narrow it down to one, so we chose 20. But what exhibition about football shirts could be complete? Well, it's classic Adidas West Germany home shirt from the 1990 World Cup. Well, that's enough bangers for one day. We hope you enjoyed this online tour of our strip exhibition, and we hope to see you in the museum looking around this exhibition when it's safe to do so. Visit nationalfootballmuseum.com for much more content and for the chance to vote in our online poll on the greatest football shirt of all time.